so when they were putting the microphone on me backstage just now, they said, I have a tiny head. <laughs> so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> also, when I get excited about something, like my work, I tend to speak very fast. So to the translators, I am very sorry. <laughs> when I graduated from engineering school in 2007, I took a job working for a digital media semiconductor company, which was headquartered in Beijing, China. It was an exciting time to be in China in 2008 because of the Beijing Olympics. South Korea did very well at that. <clears throat> However, I was making consumer electronics that were copycat iPods, and I was not happy in my work. So when the company let go of all of the engineers, myself included, I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Kenya with my family on safari to find my new path. When I got to Kenya, I visited three different regions. And in these three regions, most people would have said, oh, the lions, the zebras. <laughs> but I got hung up on looking at the power systems in these different communities. How these areas, which had no grid infrastructure, were able to develop power systems for themselves. One Maasai tribe, in particular, was located in the southeast portion of Kenya. And they had come up with what we call now a microgrid, which basically means they made their own energy generation source and then their own outlets to generate their own power. No utility company, no big grid infrastructure. And I was amazed that they used ecotourism people like me coming to visit them to fund the development of their power systems. Now, this sometimes happens when you're not a trained engineer. This is a melted battery. <laughs> and when you try to store solar power to generate and use for electricity, but you put your batteries out in the sunlight, your grid becomes useless. You cannot use electricity when the sun is not out. You cannot use electricity if you have windmills and the wind does not blow. That stability in a grid is what we get here in developed countries from having a very large grid. So when they found out I was an engineer and my family was engineers, they asked us, how could we make our microgrid more stable in Kenya? And we suggested to them that instead of having their batteries out in the sun, maybe they should dig a ditch and put their batteries at a level in the ground where the temperature was much more stable so that the power coming from the solar panels could be stored in the batteries for a much larger time period. Then we helped them dig a ditch. <laughs> then we put the batteries in, and they were amazed to find that they would get three times the amount of power out of their existing solar panel. Pretty big deal when it's such a huge investment to this tribe. Now, this is a grid that you guys are all familiar with. This is pretty much what we have, right? Nuclear power, coal, whatever, uh, wind, solar, going into a very large infrastructure. Then, eventually, going to your home. Now, there's good and bad to this infrastructure. The good, is that the power that gets generated is very stable. Wind could, have been gener wind could have been blowing last week. That then charges your cell phone tonight because the infrastructure of the grid is so regular. A microgrid doesn't have this stability. And this brings to light a growing global problem, which I refer to as power poverty. And that means that the poorest people on the planet pay the most per kilowatt hour. Now, this is very interesting, as it should be, because it gives us the room for so much development. 
Now, a microgrid, like the Maasai have in Kenya, cuts out that part in the middle in the red. It goes directly from the generation source of power to the point of use. But what it doesn't have that the big grid does is that stability that I just talked about, that efficiency. So this got me thinking, how could we make microgrids more stable? Because as we all know, we're going to be using more energy over time. There's more of us on this planet. There's going to be even more, 10 billion pretty soon, right? And all of us are going to continue to use more and more electricity, as we should. That's part of innovation. So how do we make it feasible and affordable to be using renewable energies? As soon as I got back to New York from Kenya, I started a company, Tenrate Technologies, and we got to work developing prototypes for technologies that would enable us to use that same system of power generation that we saw overseas into our Western infrastructure that needed to be updated. So we built our first product, and here it is. <laughs> this is called PicoWatt. It stands for Portable Intelligent Communicator, because I'm an engineer and I'm really crappy at coming up with names. <laughs> and Watt, obviously, because we are looking at observing and controlling power consumption. So you could think of this box as being everything the grid does in a tiny little compact unit. This is very interesting to anyone out there who's trying to develop a microgrid structure, but wants it to be more stable. Now, the interesting thing about stable power is that stable power is also efficient power. And we all know that the greenest energy out there, it's also the most free energy, is the energy we do not waste, right? It's the energy that our system that we develop for power delivery works perfectly. And if we're wasting less power, then power shouldn't be more expensive, right? It should go down in cost over time. Whereas all we're seeing is price, the price of power increasing over time and increasing even more as we add in renewable sources of energy. Now here, in Seoul, Korea, for instance, this is very interesting, po fuel poverty and power poverty. According to Gapminder, statistics came out that per capita electricity use in Korea has doubled over the past decade. You used to use 4,000 kilowatt hours per person. Now you use 8,000, twice what you used to. Some of that is you have more things, gadgets in your home, but a big portion of that is the efficiency of your grid. And this is a problem everywhere, too. In the UK, people who live in regular homes pay 10 pence per kilowatt hour, whereas if you live in government housing, you pay 19 pence per kilowatt hour, double the price of someone who lives in a normal home. This is very interesting, isn't it? That as developed as we've become as a species, our infrastructure still doesn't account for the people who cannot afford our big infrastructure. It's not simple for them to generate their own power or to live in a system that supports their innovation and therefore their increased energy use. That's why I believe and I'm dedicating my work and my continued designs to developing technologies that will make microgrids more feasible and more stable so that people living in rural parts of the world can have access to clean energy. Now, isn't it great, or wouldn't it be great, I should say, if we could design a technology that would fight these problems that people see, energy poverty, the inability to access the internet and communicate with each other with a simple mystery box solution that would give them access to clean energy and more internet so they can Skype you. <laughs> well, that's what we're working on next. So this is the first generation of PicoWatt, and this is the prototype for the second generation. 
We're making a 100 amp version of the PicoWatt that will work for a whole house solution. Uh, so in one end at the top of the box is incoming power. So wind, solar, nuclear. And on the outside uh, goes the plugs into your house. The bottom portion of the design where the little lights are blinking, you don't need to worry about that. That's just internet. Now, my team and I have already started working on this product, and we're hoping to trial it in the UK later this year. And uh, if all goes well, then I can gladly say that we're making a small step towards a great goal, and that goal is clean power for everyone. Thank you very much.